My name is Charles Bone. Today is August the 6th, 2019, and I'm in Nashville, Tennessee to interview one of the greatest lawyers I've ever known, J. Houston Gordon of Covington, Tennessee. This interview is taking place as a part of the Legal History Project of the Fellows of the Tennessee Bar Foundation. Would you state your full name, please? James Houston Gordon. And uh, where were you born and what day? I was born on September the 16th, 1946 in Camden, Benton County, Tennessee. And you and I have known each other for how long? 52 years. And where did we meet? The second week of law school at the University of Tennessee College of Law. So tell us then about where you come from. Who were your parents? Where were they from? Who were your grandparents? Tell us about your family. Well, my father was Houston Darnell Gordon. He grew up in Henderson County, Tennessee, near Wildersville. Uh, went to school at Yuma, and then was the valedictorian of Lexington High School back in the early 1930s. He uh, decided early on that he did not want to spend his the rest of his life in a corn patch in, next to the big Sandy River in West Tennessee and he went to Knoxville and uh, worked his way through college through four years and got a degree in agriculture and he was a farmer and a county extension agent for the University of Tennessee. He for met, how long? He was, well, both of those all of his life but for the extension service about 40 years. And my mother, he met her in Meigs County, Tennessee. She was one of 10 of the Culver House children. And she, uh, her name is, was Frances Jane Gordon. And she went to five colleges before she got her degree. And what about their parents? Well, uh, dad's parents uh, were Ellis Houston Gordon and Ava Darnell Gordon. They were, uh, poor farmers in rural Henderson County, Tennessee. Dad was one of uh, four children. He was the oldest, 10 years older than his next sibling. My mother was one of 10 children. She had five brothers and four sisters. Her father was Chester A. Culver House and her mother was Martha Dixie Culver House. And they lived in Meigs County, Tennessee. Uh, was that 10 mile? Ten, well, they li actually lived at Uchi. Uchi is uh, five miles from Ten Mile, two miles from Peakland, and six, 60 miles from any place you've ever heard of. And there are some famous Culver houses, but one in particular in today's world. Well, my first cousin, A.B. Culver House, uh, he and I, uh, as you well know, he roomed with us one year when we were in law school. A.B. is the now the uh, ambassador to Australia for the United States and A.B. was Reagan's White House counsel and Howard Baker's chief legislative assistant and is uh, he was a and is uh, has been and is a power broker in the D.C. area. Okay so <coughs> let's uh, let's talk about your childhood and where you grew up and how many places you lived during your childhood. Well, I was born in Benton County, Tennessee, and I apparently, as our next door neighbor told my mother one time, Jane, that's the ugliest child I've ever seen. I think we left town because of that. At the age of six months, we ended up back in Meigs County, where I went to a 10 Mile Elementary School for uh, two years, and then we moved to Carroll County where I went to Atwood Elementary School for two years, and then we moved to Parsons, Tennessee, where I went to Parsons Elementary for two years, and then Parsons Junior High School, and then Parsons High School for one year, and then I ended up in Covington for the last three years at Byers Hall High School. So every time I made friends, we moved. <clears throat> so tell us more about that, because you you were, why were you moving? Well, my dad, loved farming, but he grew up in the Depression and he was afraid to borrow money. So he would save up money working for the University Extension Service 
until he thought he had enough money to farm and then we would farm a while and almost starve to death and then he'd go back to the extension service. And so we moved a lot uh, and uh, that had a tremendous impact on my growing up years because uh, every time we moved it was a new crowd and I was little and it was I was quote fresh meat every time I hit a new school because I was a new kid in town. Let's pick on him a while. Looks like you survived. I survived. I learned a lot from that experience. And what did your father grow, <coughs> grow when he farmed? What Did he have crops or cattle? or? Yes, all of the above. We, uh, it's interesting. Uh, we raised dairy cattle. We raised beef cattle. We raised pork. We raised, at one time or the other, we had sheep and goats. And... Uh, uh, we had corn and cotton, and in my earliest years, we had tobacco. And uh, you've left out one animal. In his later years, did horses. you all not have horses in some special kind? Yes, my dad loved horses, and he had walking horses for a long time, but then he got irritated with the way that people were treating those animals, and he changed to Peruvian paso horses which are the world's smoothest riding horse. And I had those all the time he was alive, I, even after I became a lawyer and got out of the Army and moved back to Covington. I uh, uh, kept horses because my dad loved them. And what about uh, working while you were growing up? Did you help your dad on the farm? And you had, well, for, uh, tell us about your siblings and their ages and where they come in in your life? Well, I'm the third of four children. My sister, Sarah Jane Thornburg, uh, is a retired pharmacist. She was five years older than I. My late brother, Chester Darnell Gordon, was a, uh, had a master's in entomology from Clemson and had a pesticide, a pest control business for a while. And then he had two uh, big heart attacks and he became a beloved uh, biology and science teacher for some 30 years. And uh, my younger brother was the, in the first veterinary class at the University of Tennessee Veterinary School, and he uh, was a veterinarian, and then he was the mayor of Covington for a couple of terms. So uh, when you all were growing up, were you... Uh, were, did you volunteer to help your dad on the farm? There was no volunteering with my dad. You did as he commanded. <laughs> the, the, uh, I grew up slobbing hogs and chopping cotton and doing the things that you would do in rural America at that time, and particularly in rural America where uh, not, no one around was wealthy, no one around had any, any uh, money much things, but uh, we were rich in family, but not, not with stuff. And you lived in a lot of rural communities, n yeah. never in a big city. No, never, until, and, until I moved to the Washington area right. in the Army, yes. So you moved uh, to Covington when you were in high school, Correct. after your freshman year? Sophomore year. Sophomore year, and uh, you were a star basketball player. Well, it wasn't as good as I thought it was, but we were pretty good. We uh, played uh, 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 our senior year. We were 35 and, and uh, 7. And you score a lot of points? No, I was a point guard. I averaged about 10 points a game. And what about, where is Covington for those of us who uh, might not know? Well, Covington is uh, a r rural West Tennessee town in the near the Mississippi River. We are 10 miles from the Mississippi River and we are, excuse me, <coughs> we are uh, about 35 minutes from Memphis, so we are kind of a bedroom community. It's Tipton County, Tennessee. It's the county seat. It's a, a middle class uh, town with about, uh, presently the population is about 60% uh, African American and 38% uh, white and 2 or 3% uh, Hispanic and others. Well, let's go back to, uh, to high school and 
uh, tell us about what else you did in high school other than uh, play basketball. Well, I was uh, <laughs> I was a pretty good student, but I wasn't a very serious student. I I uh, uh, did well enough to be in the beta club, and I was uh, always involved in the productions that school had, and uh, I was. Uh, Productions I ran, ran mean, track. mean you were an actor? Yes, a thespian. <laughs> and I'm sure you were wonderful in that role. Not not wonderful in that or any other role, but that's that's a, uh, I did that, and I I liked uh, history. I liked uh, I, my high school basketball coach made me play baseball to keep me out of trouble, but uh, in general. Uh, uh, I worked on the farm. I had a part-time job all the way through high school after I was old enough to work. And uh, high school was a good experience. And what kind of part-time jobs did you have? <laughs> I was an electrician's helper, among other things. I was a uh, produce stocker in a grocery store. And uh, uh, I measured cotton my senior year. And how many people were in your graduating class in 1964? 114. And where did you rank? Tenth. So you were a little smarter than you said you were. I think I think I did okay, but my effort was not very great. I, I enjoyed other stuff more. Mm-hmm. And did, well, did you play a musical <coughs> musical instrument? No. Did you sing? I tried. And did you go to church? I did. Where? We uh, attended the Church of Christ in Covington, Tennessee, where my dad was an elder. And, uh, and you graduated in 1964. I did. In, in May or June. And what happened then? Well, <laughs> I thought I was a better basketball player than I was, and I thought that I would go to the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. I, I talked to the people at University of Tennessee at Martin, where my siblings had gone, but I thought I would go play big-time basketball, and I have the dubious distinction of being the last guy cut from the worst freshman team in the history of the University of Tennessee. I went back to UT Martin and tried to play basketball for a couple of years and realized I was not going to be a Celtic, and I discovered girls and social life, and uh, so I I uh, became a history major, a member of the Alpha Tau Omega fraternity, and uh, uh, enjoyed college. And were you involved in your fraternity life? I was, not not in any officer. I ran for student government president, and that was the first election that I lost. And who beat you? A fellow by the name of Paul Blaylock. Paul uh, is a a uh, surgeon and a lawyer who lives out on the West Coast and has done extremely well. And he's a great friend and supporter of the University of Tennessee at Martin. And how did you, uh, uh, how did you do with your grades at UT Martin? I did well. I did well. I graduated magna cum laude and uh, had, had a history major, uh, political science and English minor. And what did you do during the summers or did you? I worked. <laughs> and where did you work? Well, I worked on the pipeline. I worked uh, in construction. I sold insurance. I measured cotton for the uh, farm uh, credit farm. It was FA, it's not FHA. Back then it was uh, Agricultural Stabilization Conservation Service. What is measuring cotton? Well, you're given a certain amount of acreage allotment for cotton and other crops. And back then, uh, farmers would get an allotment, say, for 75 acres, and you would go measure it and make sure that they did not have more than 75 acres. And one of the side lights was that you got to uh, report any uh, whiskey stills you found. Did you get rewarded for that? No. You just reported them? Theoretically. Theoretically. So 
Um, this might be a good time <coughs> for you to tell us uh, what the University of Tennessee at Martin meant to you at that time and throughout your life. Well, it it's, was a life-changing experience. Uh, before I went to University of Tennessee at Martin, of course, in 1963 was Kennedy's assassination. And I was fascinated with history all of my life. I enjoyed history from the time I was a, a little child. And the at University of Tennessee at Martin, because I enjoyed history, I took history classes from uh, Dr. Unger and I took political science classes from Dr. Morrill and both of those men uh, were great influences on my life. Uh, we had mandatory reserve officer training corps at that time so I did two years of military training while I was at UT Martin uh, and uh, it was, I mean, civil rights started then so we, we were caught up in that uh, era and it was extremely interesting and then the fraternity I was in uh, there was some really really bright bright people there Judge Claiborne Peoples, Judge Joe Riley, we have a brain surgeon uh, King Tipton, we have several pharmacists, engineers and our chapter had the highest grade point average of the national fraternity for three years running. Well, they were a bunch of smart people. Wow. And as a result of being around all those people, the discussions were just fascinating. Uh, every evening we would watch Star Trek at 4.30 and then we'd, we'd watch the Vietnam War uh, and the body count uh, on the evening news. So Was this like at the fraternity house? You live at the fraternity house? Yes, uh, one, one quarter I lived on the back porch. <laughs> So tell us more about that. Well, was, that, was there heat and air there? Or? No, no, it was the spring quarter. I didn't need heat and air, and it it, it was uh, it had a uh, uh, what do you call the mosquito uh, screen net? So we on the back porch. So I I just I had a bed out there. So that's where I lived. Did you have to pay extra for that experience? No, I paid a little less. Okay, got it. So uh, so UT Martin was a great experience for you and one you've remembered your entire lifetime. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it was uh, really interesting, uh, the professors, and they still that way, and I, I, I'm, I can't say enough good things about that small college in rural West Tennessee. In my opinion, it's the biggest bang for the buck in higher education in the state. And you've been a major benefactor of that college. Well, I've given money, yes. And there's a scholarship in your name, is there not? There's a group of scholars that have our name, yeah. And so tell us about that. Let's don't be, this is not the time to be <laughs> modest. So. Well, I've been very fortunate. Uh, and I remember the life-changing uh, circumstances that occurred while I was at UT Martin. And in particular, I mentioned Dr. Morrill, and I also need to mention uh, Major uh, Jack Adams, who was the fraternity advisor, uh, had a tremendous impact on our ability to discuss hot topics, civil rights, the war in Vietnam, uh, be able to discuss those things in a reasonable, quiet, intelligent way without getting all bent out of shape. And because of that, and because I was around Claiborne Peoples and Joe Riley and uh, Robert Smythe, or Smith, I call him Smith Smythe, it's S-M-Y-T-H-E. Uh, Who's also to, a lawyer. Yeah, I went to law school. Right. I, I hadn't thought about going to law school. I hadn't thought about anything except being a Celtic and now you avoided my question about huh? what <coughs> your how your relationship with UT Martin now. There's a number of scholarships in your name that because of the money you and Deb have given. Yes, and that pays for students. Well, we st it started out with the idea that we wanted to find kids who were like the kids that I grew up with and like the way I was that we needed 
we needed financial help. I, along with John Smart's daughter uh, at Knoxville, received the first ever uh, University of Tennessee Alumni Association scholarship when I went to school. When you went to undergrad, yeah. graduate school in Knoxville? Undergrad. Right. And that was at UT Martin where I got the benefit of that. And because of that, uh, I've always felt like you give back. You don't, uh, you know, it's just stuff. And if I can help kids along the way, and Deb feels the same way, we've contributed to UT Martin. We now have merged the Gordon Scholarship, Leadership Scholarship with the uh, Ned Ray McWhorter Institute, it's a part of that now, and which uh, uh, was named for the governor, and uh, Clayton McWhorter funded a, a large part of that. Uh, John and Betty Tanner are involved in that, and it gives scholarships and opportunities for young people to learn and grow uh, at, at the school. Uh, I'm very blessed to uh, be able to participate in that, and as you well know, they named a museum down there for me. Trying to get to that, so tell us about the museum. Well, it's, uh, it has uh, traveling exhibits uh, that are of interest from photography to art to history that come into the museum, and uh, they just put my name on the door, and that's a uh, that's a museum that's in the Paul Meek Library. Now, we, you've <coughs> mentioned, you and I both have mentioned uh, Deb, so l let's just stop there and tell us about who Deb is. She's an answer to a prayer. Uh, she... Uh, uh, More than one prayer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Debbie uh, Watridge McCool uh, is my wife, now of 31 years. Uh, we have raised our boys together, and uh, she is a pharmacist. She, uh, she is an entrepreneur. She's a designer. Uh, she uh, is extremely bright and insightful. She uh, uh, is pretty, uh, and she is kind. She's the kindest person I've ever met. So why don't we just stay there and tell us about the boys uh, and the blended family, and th then we'll go into the Charles Bone era of law school and beyond. All right. The uh, uh, Debbie and I met uh, in 1986, and we were married in 1988. I had a uh, I was a single parent, had a son, Nathan, uh, and she had two little boys, uh, Baker and Blake. And when we married, uh, we became a blended family. And the neat thing about the boys uh, is they have never referred to each other as stepbrothers. They've never referred to each other as this is my step anything, it's just my brother. They uh, had a band in high school, a hard rock band, who Baker was the drummer and Nathan, uh, my biological son, was a guitar player. And they uh, played down on Beale Street in uh, New Daisy. They, they had uh, a following. They decided to do a, a CD, an album, of their original songs, which they did. They called their band, band Blend, and they went to Route 1, Mississippi, where all the blues players recorded. It's a chicken farm down in Mississippi. And they recorded uh, a, a CD that they had pre-sold to all of their uh, following, and they were pretty popular for a little high school band. And, but they, they're just close. They, they hit our house, uh, everybody hits our house uh, twice a year, and uh, uh, we have nine grandchildren, and they were here during the July holidays, and that's 17 people in the house at once. So, so tell us uh, 
where the boys are, where they live, who they're, <coughs> who they're married to, and who your grandchildren are with in, in the next 10 minutes. I mean, well, I, I know you could talk about. Uh, yeah, I can talk about them a long time. A long time, time right. Nathan uh, is a Dartmouth graduate. He went to Dartmouth College. From Covington High School. From Covington High School. He was a valedictorian of Covington High School. Uh, he uh, met a young woman at Dartmouth by the name of Juliet Morgan. They now live in New York in Manhattan. He's a hedge fund manager. And uh, they have four children, uh, Emmanuel, Luke Houston, August, and Celeste. And... Uh, Juliet is a full-time mom, and with that crew, that's a lot of work, particularly in Manhattan. Uh, so that's Nathan. Nathan, uh, uh, his, the next son is Baker, Baker McCool. Baker went to the University of Mi uh, Mississippi State University and got a landscape architecture degree and came out of college right when the bubble burst and uh, all of the construction stopped and uh, he decided he did not want to be a, uh, a glorified yard boy so he decided that he would become a part-time fireman. Uh, he is married to uh, uh, Allison Allison also went to Mississippi State, and she is a pharmacist. Uh, they have three children, and that's uh, Maggie, who's the oldest grandchild, uh, John Baker, who's John Baker, and, and Eliza, who's the whirling dervish. She's like her grandmother, Deb. She's always going. And so... Baker became a fireman, full-time fireman, EMT, paramedic. He teaches at the local, teaches paramedics at the local community college, and he is an ultra runner. He did the SCAR run this year near Chattanooga, which is a 72-mile run without stopping, and he did it in 23 hours and 56, sec 56 minutes. Uh, could we take a short break? I need a... Houston, tell us uh, about the third child. and um, John Blake. John, John Blake, Blake McCool. Uh, he went to the University of Colorado. Uh, we were uh, out there uh, one summer when I was Democratic Party chair. He's 14 and he announces to us, this is where I'm going to go to college. And we thought, oh yeah, uh, he'll forget about it, but he didn't. And so he graduated from the University of Colorado and is a software uh, developer. He's really good at it. And he and his wife live in Colorado Springs. Uh, her name is Caroline. Caroline uh, uh, Peyton McCool was uh, a UT graduate uh, in communications. And she is a, was a school teacher for a short period of time, and now she is teaching our grandson Eli and his little sister Emmy. Uh, and they, Blake works from home for a company here in Nashville uh, and is a equity partner in a new company uh, that they just uh, started and is uh, uh, he's described as a problem solver so I have uh, Nathan who went to Dartmouth uh, Baker who went to Mississippi State and Blake who went to University of Colorado Boulder so I have a Yankee a redneck and a granola head <laughs> and you're blessed I am blessed they are good, good human beings. They are good, good people. They are honest. They are kind. They are strong. Uh, Baker has 
he was the one who fainted when we took him to the doctor to get his shots, and now he is uh, saving people's lives. So, And did he not just run 72 miles in a weekend or something? Yes, he and a friend of his did what they call the SCAR run, uh, and he ran from the... Uh, the Appalachian Trail from the Tennessee Georgia line to the uh, Appalachian Trail at the North Carolina Tennessee line. Uh, they say it's 72 miles on the map, but he said his GPS said it was 74.4, and they did it in 23 hours and 56 minutes, which uh, is really amazing since I couldn't get him to jog a step with me growing up. Perfect. So let's go back now uh, and um, restart uh, your career after college and uh, talk about law, <coughs> school, law school and what's happened in the last 52 years. Uh, well, starting with uh, UT Martin and the conversations that were, we had, uh, obviously the civil rights movement began the Civil Rights Act of 1964 uh, created a lot of interest and uh, we had a lot of discussions about civil rights. Uh, we had a lot of discussions about the Vietnam War. Uh, when I left uh, UT Martin in the uh, spring of 1967, the war was going on in a big way. Uh, we had gone from 16,000 troops when Kennedy was president to uh, more than 370,000 troops by 1967. And in the uh, year following it, it went up to a half a million combat troops. So the war was on our minds and the war was debated every night. And uh, we, my... Uh, as I said, our fraternity advisor was a major in the Army, so he was keen on us discussing the Vietnam War. And I had taken reserve officers training corps training at UT Martin for two years. Well, as you know, when we got to law school, uh, the, there was a draft, but the draft deferments were done away with our first year in law school and we had some choices to make. And so while I was in law school, I decided that I would finish the last two years of reserve officer training uh, corps, the upper division levels, and I did. And uh, by the time I graduated from law school, I had been commissioned as a second lieutenant military police corps. Uh, I decided, uh, and we'll talk about more about law school, I guess, as we go along. But uh, I decided that I would finish that training uh, because I didn't want to be drafted as a grunt. And I uh, felt, a because of the history in my family, particularly the Culver House side, uh, serving in the military was a big deal. And you, so you um, you signed up to finish uh, your training so that you could complete law school. Correct. And um, again, just because of the history of this moment, just give us a little more detail about the Vietnam War. I know we're going to talk about it a lot later because that became very important to your career and your life. Well, as a history major, you know, uh, in upper division history, particularly at UT Martin, in upper division history with uh, Dr. Morrill in political science, we debated the pros and cons of fighting a land war in Asia, which Eisenhower after World War II said, it's, we, we don't want to fight a land war in Asia. There are more of them than there are of us. Well, this country that most of us had never heard of or knew anything about at all. Uh, we had to look it up on the globe to find out where Vietnam was. But the war was committed that we would fight in Vietnam. It started with Eisenhower, and you know I've written a manuscript about this, so I don't want to do the whole manuscript. But it started, we propped up a regime in South Vietnam with our military power and our money 
and Kennedy continued that even though he had argued it against it why uh, uh, Eisenhower was president and uh, we were sending more and more troops to Vietnam while we were in undergraduate school and that meant that people sitting next to you in class ended up in Vietnam. In my high school class uh, there were two guys uh, or in my high school there were two guys that were killed in Vietnam early on. Uh, one's Jerry McCullough and the other one was Ronnie Smith and then a friend of mine from a nearby town, Jimmy Blaylock, got killed there and the Austin young man, African American man by the name of Austin in my hometown got killed. So those things were on our minds at that time and we were debating those things and we were concerned about what's going to happen and what's going to happen quite frankly, to each one of us. And it, uh, one more thing. In the spring of 1967, if you will recall, uh, there was a big debate going on about the war in Vietnam, and uh, the leader of the Civil Rights Movement, uh, Martin Luther King, on April the 20th, 1967, gave a speech about the war in Vietnam for which he was condemned by the American press. But it struck a chord with me because I grew up in a very, uh, very faith-driven home. Uh, we worked side by side with African American people and they were our friends. And when I was a little boy, one of my best friends was named Alec Taylor. And he and I always, we asked our mothers when we were little children, uh, you know, we, we lived next door to each other on a farm. We worked together. My dad and his dad worked together every day on the farm. We read the same school books, but we didn't go to church and we didn't go to school together. So we asked our mothers, why? And both of them gave the same answer. Someday you understand. I hope someday I understand. Amen. So let's go to law school. Okay. But why, how did you decide on going to law school? How many lawyers <laughs> did you know uh, when when you decided to go to law school? One. Who was that? My uncle James Dudley Culver House in Meigs County, Tennessee, was the only lawyer I knew. I'd never been in a courtroom. I'd never seen him in a courtroom. I didn't know anything about law school. And I went to law school because I didn't want to go to medical school. I knew that I wasn't going to, I, I don't do well with sick people. Uh, and so I, I'm talking with Claiborne Peoples and Robert Smith at, the, at uh, the fraternity house and they're going to take the law school aptitude test. And I said, well they called it the LSAT test. I said, well what's that? And Claiborne advised me that I couldn't go to law school unless I took that test, so I took the test. And you passed? I got, I got into UT Knoxville, so obviously I passed. So, you, that, so that was all you, that was your total decision-making process? Yeah. Just following Claiborne and Robert Smith? Yeah, uh, long-range planning is 20 minutes. That's you know? right. <laughs> oh, I, actually, it's 90 minutes. It's short-term, 20 minutes. So you ended up in, uh, so where, what did you do that summer of 67? I think I was still measuring cotton and working. Uh, that's, no, that's the summer I worked on the pipeline. That's the summer I was the, what I called the tar baby, where they put these huge pipes together. They take tar and they uh, put tar on the seams so they don't leak. Well, I was the guy doing that, and it's really... Uh, hot and I lost my uh, epidermis two or three times that summer because it's so hot. So then you ended up in Knoxville <clears throat> in uh, late August, early September of 1967. Right. And how did you find the law school? What do you mean how did I find it? Well. I lived a block away. That's all right. All right. Okay. I lived on Clinch Avenue. Claiborne and I had an apartment in the basement of a house on Clinch, Clinch Avenue. And the second week of law school, I met you. 
and the rest is history. The rest is history. <laughs> so tell us about law school. <clears throat> and leave me out, but tell us about law school and what it meant to you, professors you liked, uh, the courses you liked, uh, how, what the impact was that, uh, that law school had on your life. Well, it's the first time that I ever actually thought. Uh, I'd started trying to think a little bit when uh, Dr. Morrill's political science class, but I, it's the first time that I ever tr really tried to think through things. Uh, and Derwood Jones, uh, who had an introduction to law, uh, he uh, startled me about the third week of law school when I asked being the, uh, what do you call it, the retired, quiet person I am, I held up my hand and asked a question and it began was, Mr. Jones, can you sue? And I remember his, distinctly his response. He looked down at me and said, Mr. Gordon, you can sue the Bishop of Boston for bastardy. The question is, can you collect? And all of a sudden, I thought, well, that was kind of a stupid question. And so I, I began thinking a little bit, and then uh, Professor Cook, Joe Cook, who taught criminal law to virtually every lawyer for four or five decades uh, in Tennessee, he uh, was a great influence. Uh, as you well know, uh, uh, we were walking down the hall one day, and there was a sign on the wall that said tryouts for the moot court team. And you said to me, why don't we try out? And I said, okay, let's try out. I did not know what the word moot meant. But I tried out and I, this is when uh, you think somebody's messing around your life it was an accountant's liability question, and I had not had torts at that time. And I went to the library to ask Bill Humphreys, who was working in the library at that time, great guy, where I could find something about accountant's liability and misrepresentation and uh, that kind of stuff. So he referred me to Prosser on torts and it was about fraud and deceit. Well, I've got my little yellow pad that showed that I was a law student. Uh, and I start reading Prosser on torts on fraud and deceit, and it just happened that I wrote down the definition for deceit. During the tryouts and the oral argument, one of the judges looked down and said, well, counselor, what does deceit mean? And like I was brilliant, <laughs> which I wasn't, but I looked down and I said, well, Your Honor, I'd refer you to Prosser on Tort section such and such where he defines deceit as follows. They thought I knew what I was doing. <laughs> I didn't, but I got on the moot court team and I was the youngest guy on the team and the others were upperclassmen and uh, as uh, chance would have it, every time I argued we won and when I didn't we lost. So everybody thought I knew what I was doing. I didn't, but it was okay. They thought I did. Joe Cook was a great influence on me, and his wife was too, because she taught me to quit talking from back here and to talk out here. Because according to my speech teacher in college, this is the Mississippi mud that I was used to in the back of my throat where I'm talking from now, but when I push it out to the front, you can tell the difference. She helped me do that. She was a debate coach at the University of Tennessee undergrad. Yes, she was. As, as I remember that. Yeah. yeah. And, and he was the next the, year you were on the moot court team too. That's, that's correct. So um, there's another professor that you um, had that had a great influence on you that uh, had a military background. Probably in retrospect, probably Colonel R. McDonald Gray, 
Uh, he and Dr. Morrill, I mentioned, were the two professors in my life that had the most influence on my life. And it's little bitty snippets. You know, you, you remember Colonel Gray. He was gruff. He was a line officer in World War II, which means that he was in combat, but he was also a Judge Advocate General's officer. And he, he was very strict. You didn't come into his class late. You didn't, you, you, if you cut class, he docked your grade, uh, as you and I both know, because we were out on the street when they bombed Hanoi. Uh, the uh, Colonel Gray liked the National Moot Court team. He went to all of our practices, and he knew that I was in the reserve officer training, and he came up to me in the library while I was studying for finals. And I'd been commissioned as a second lieutenant military police type, and he walked up and he sat down, and I'm going to quote Colonel Gray because he was gruff and he used uh, colorful language. He looked at me and he said, Houston, son, I don't think you'll make a very good damn policeman. <laughs> and I laughed and I said, Colonel Gray, I think you're right. He said, well, why don't you apply for the uh, branch transfer to the JAG Corps? And I promise you this is the truth. I said, okay, Colonel Gray, what's the JAG Corps? And he said, it's the Judge Advocate General's Corps. There are lawyers in the Army. I did that when I was in the Army. And so he explained to me what the JAG Corps was and what a branch transfer was, and I applied. And lo and behold, I got the branch transfer subject to my passing the Tennessee Bar. I, got the, I passed the Tennessee Bar, and I became a Judge Advocate General's officer and then they send you this little form, and it's where you would like to serve. And I used to call it the you got to be kidding form. It's you could choose where your duty station was, and you could go to Fort Polk, Louisiana, which meant that you were getting ready to go to Vietnam. You could go to Fort Benning, Georgia, which meant you were getting ready to go to Vietnam. You could go to Fort Lewis, Washington, which meant you were getting ready to go to Vietnam. Well, Colonel Gray suggested, because of my moot court experience, which was doing appellate arguments, that I apply for the Defense Appellate Division in Washington, D.C., and I asked him again what that was, and he explained that's where convicted soldiers' cases come, and you represent them in their appeals, what you've been doing in the moot court competition. And so when I filled out my, you've got to be kidding form, my, they gave you three choices. My first choice was Defense Appellate Division, Washington, D.C. My second choice, <laughs> Defense Appellate, Washington, D.C. And my third choice was Defense Appellate, Washington, D.C. And that's where I went. I was assigned there. Before we go there, is there anything else about law school that's memorable? Oh, uh, the Broom Road Gang. Uh, the, the guys who roomed together with us, you and I, uh, really an interesting, and you know, we've always been interested in history and politics, and this was an interesting group. We had uh, Roger Kessley, a Republican whose father was the finance commissioner for Winfield Dunn. We had Steve Avery, a Democrat from Alamo, Tennessee, whose father was the commissioner of corrections for Buford Ellington and Frank Clement. We had you, who's uh, a Democrat for life. We had me for a, Dem uh, a Democrat for most of my life, and we had my first cousin, A.B. Culverhouse, who was a Republican from East Tennessee, and we all lived together in West Knoxville, and we were actively involved in political campaigns against each other, but we were close, close friends, great guys. So we, all, we lived on Broom Road to start with. Right. But then we moved into a neighborhood <laughs> on Cortland Drive, right? Right. I think they put the house up across the street for sale about two weeks after we moved in. And we lived on Cortland Drive, a real quiet subdivision that had very important people from Knoxville living there yes. for a year, as yes. I remember it. Yes, and they were thankful when we left. 
Okay. And that belonged to a doctor, I think. Dr. Who, Avery. Right. Uh, Harry Avery, that's Steve's brother. Right. So uh, we had a lot of other friends and a lot of other professors, but those were the kind of the, the, the one other person that you haven't mentioned that has been your great friend forever that started in law school. Blanchard too. So tell us about Blanchard. Blanchard is a really great lawyer in Memphis. He does estate planning and, and uh, tax work, and he's a, a wonderful lawyer. He represented, uh, was appointed to represent Lisa Marie Presley during the Elvis estate. He is known as a lawyer's lawyer. Uh, he's uh, selected as a pillar of excellence by the University of Memphis Law School, even though he went to Knoxville to law school. Uh, just a good guy. He's one of the guys that I think if I were in jail in China and I called him, he'd come and get me. And he didn't live with us because he was married during law school. Right, but he wanted to. He right. wanted to live with right. us. Right. All right, we won't go any further with that. <laughs> so, so let's uh, graduate from law school. And, and what, when did you graduate? May of 1970. And what did you do then? I, well, the summer before, I was at uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, uh, doing my basic military training. Uh, Claiborne Peoples did his that same summer as well. And uh, I, when I graduated from law school, I had to pass the bar, which uh, we took that summer. And I, the bar, uh, Tennessee Bar's, uh, People let me know early because I needed to know to be able to get into the uh, basic class. And I found out uh, a few weeks before you guys did that I had uh, passed the bar. And I went to Fort Lee, Virginia to start with for additional training, was commissioned as a, went from first lieutenant to captain. Uh, really quick promotions when you go into the JAG Corps. And I did training there and then went to the 58th basic class at uh, University of Virginia at the Judge Advocate General School there. They have a new wonderful building now. We were, it wasn't so wonderful when I was there. But that was a great experience. Uh, the several weeks of training, uh, I became enamored with studying about Jefferson because he designed the University of Virginia. And I read a lot of, of uh, his writings and visited Monticello so much they stopped charging me a fee for going up there and uh, that had a great impact on my life. Not so much who he was but the thoughts and the ideals that he espoused. And then <coughs> after your training, after your schooling as a JAG officer, where did you go? Well, let me tell one story about Jack School because it's relevant to where Please do. what yeah. happened. One of my best friends, another one of those friends that I think I could be in jail in China and he come help me, is Robert C. Roth. Bob Roth from Wisconsin, Wisconsin, and Bob and I sat together and we roomed together when we were at the Jack School. While we were in class one day, Colonel Overholt came in and advised us that, of course, the, uh, uh, in November of 1969, the publicity hit about the uh, My Lai Massacre in Vietnam, which was where American soldiers on March 16, 1968, slaughtered uh, up to 500 Vietnamese civilians, uh, old men, women, children, babes in arms, they just simply slaughtered them. Uh, there were rapes, gang rapes, uh, a, uh, two line companies were involved even though when the publicity came out it was only about one and only, really only about one officer, a second lieutenant by the name of William L. Calley, Jr. So by the time we had gone to law school, all of this publicity was out about what had happened. And by the time I went to Jack, uh, finished law school, it was out there. 
by the time I went to the JAG course, Seymour Hirsch had written all of his articles. And, Except, and who is Seymour Hirsch? Seymour Hirsch is a journalist, uh, independent journalist, who received a Pulitzer Prize for what he wrote about the My Lai Massacre. And I'd read all that stuff. So I'm sitting in class when they start Callie's uh, Colonel Overholt, who became the ju Judge Advocate General later on after I left the Army. Colonel Overholt announced that they were going about to begin the trial of Lieutenant Callie. And me being the deep thinker that I am, I turned to Captain Roth sitting next to me and I said, well, they ought to fry the blank. And he, in a very lawyerly way, said, Houston, don't you think we ought to wait till they get the facts? The irony of that is I ultimately ended up representing Lieutenant Callie and he ended up being the prosecution on the appeals. But I go to Washington and i um, when did you go to Washington? I'm not sure of the exact date, but it was sometime after I finished JAG school, probably November of 1970. JAG school, of course, is Judge Advocate General School. Right. And you were stationed then in Washington. At the NASA building at the corner of uh, uh, Route 7, Falls Church, Virginia, and Bailey's Crossroads. Did they have other lawyers there? There were 25, approximately 25 lawyers. My commanding officer at that time was uh, Colonel George McCartan. McCartan was a really, he was the consummate gentleman and officer. And he paid attention to his young lawyers and he got more out of us than I think. Uh, I had two bosses and he got twice as much out of me as, as his successor did. But he was just a good guy, and I was appointed to represent soldiers convicted of crimes in Vietnam. I, uh, they were convicted everything from murder to the khaki mafia, where one of my uh, clients uh, was the guy who ran the what they called the khaki mafia, and that was the kickbacks for the steak and beer concessions in Vietnam. He was convicted and sentenced to be reduced from E9 to E1 and fined $25,000 and he wrote out a check to the United States Treasury for $25,000 when they announced the Senate. Uh, I represented people who, uh, one who, a uh, young African American, I, I never forget him, who, who killed a captain by the name of Stormy Gar over a Afro comb in Korea after he left Vietnam and the Afro comb was in his pocket and a sergeant major came by and said, Green, get that comb out of your pocket. He said, I can't do that. It was the only thing left from his best buddy who got blown to smithereens in Vietnam. He said, you better get it out of your pocket or I'm going to do whatever he threatened him with. Well, he took it out of his pocket, put it in his uh, pants pocket, and was walking toward the armory. And he pulled out his weapon, the M16, and was walking back. And a captain by the name of Stormy Gar walked up to him, Green, where are you going with that weapon? He said, I'm going to kill the first sergeant. If anybody tries to stop me, I'm going to kill them. And Stormy Gar says, well, I guess you'll have to shoot me. And so he did. And then he took the rifle and shot half his face off. I had other cases, and one of them was a case involving a fellow by the name of Larry Burton who was tried, and it took them like six years to get him to trial. And I thought, about, well, there's something about speedy trial in the book somewhere. And so the first time I argued at the Court of Military Appeals, which is at that time known as the Supreme Court of the military, I'm arguing the Burton case, and I, not knowing any better, uh, being young and naive and not just not knowing any better, I told uh, the three judges, Court of Military Appeals, I began my argument by saying, may it please the court, I've read every, every decision that this court has rendered and every decision that all of the military courts of review have rendered on speedy trial and quite frankly, they make no sense at all. And 
the two older judges on the side went, um, 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 and that we had a new, new chief judge, Darden, Judge Darden from Georgia, and he leaned over and he grinned and he said, well, Captain Gordon, what would you suggest we do about it? And I gave them five suggestions, and they took three of them and changed the law on speedy trial in the military. Well, of course, when, I, when that decision came down, once again, the people in the office thought I knew what I was doing. I didn't. But they, they uh, thought I did, and then shortly after that, I was appointed to defend Lieutenant Cowell. So let's, uh, let's see if we can talk through the Cali case here before <coughs> we take a break. Is okay. It, it, and you, you're just going to have to, I mean. I'll do it quickly. Well. I think. Um, you, you, you tell us what we need to know about the life of Houston Gordon as it relates to the Cali case. And if we want to know more, we can buy the book. <laughs> Which I think I've finished. <laughs> I hope I have. Uh, Lieutenant Cowley, you've got to put it in the context of the Vietnam War. In 1967, Westmoreland has become the commander of General Mar Westmoreland. General William C. Westmoreland has become the commander of Military Assistance Command in Vietnam, MACV. He has up, up the ante in Vietnam. He is going to have a war of attrition, which means that we need more combat troops. We went from 16,000 under Kennedy to by 1968, we had a half a million combat troops. He, his strategy was we'll kill more of them than they kill of us. And that's where we, and the way you keep that score is with body counts. You remember watching television and we watched them at the fraternity house before ever went to law school. They'd come on and uh, American soldiers who killed 3,400 Vietnamese and lost two people. Well, if we're winning the war at, with those odds, why in the world do we need more troops? We started asking those questions. Well, in 1967, Callie, uh, William L. Callie Jr. was a young man from Florida. He graduated 667 out of class 732 in high school. He failed out of junior college with one semester. He had two or three jobs, none of which he did very well at. He was working as an insurance policy investigator and was sent to Mexico to try to find a pilot who they had claimed that he was dead, and he didn't find the pilot, but he found Senor Frog, uh, the uh, well-known bar throughout Mexico, and he frittered away his money and uh, drank a lot, and he learned, he ran out of money, and he uh, headed to California, uh, and while there, his mail finally caught up with him, and the draft board was looking for him, and he started back home uh, to uh, go back home to North Carolina, and on the way, uh, he ran out of gas, ran out of money, and he went to a local recruiter and told them what was happening, and he signs up for the Army. He's uh, trained as a clerk. He goes to Fort Lewis, Washington, where he's a clerk. But in that year, in 1966 and 1967, they had this huge push for more officers. There were more second lieutenants commissioned in that one year span than there were in the entire rest of the war. By the United States Army. Army. And the Army. Uh, Somebody suggested he to go to OCS school, and for some unknown reason, they suggested it. Oh, officer candidate school. He goes to officer candidate school. He doesn't do well to officer candidate school, but he's commissioned as second lieutenant. His training is his and another second lieutenant in that same group. Training was cut short by two weeks. 
before he went to Vietnam. He arrives in Vietnam in November. Uh, he's out in the field by December. And uh, in February of 1968, uh, this, the North Vietnamese uh, began the, what was known as the Tet Offensive, where in 42 of the 66 major cities in Vietnam and on every, every military post in the South, they were attacked all at one time. They were attacked, I mean the United States? United States military, the Koreans, our allies, the Australians, uh, the Canadians, all of us were, all of those places were attacked at one time and overrun. It was so bad. Of course, everybody's been saying we're winning the war, we're winning the war, particularly Westmoreland and uh, uh, the Johnson administration saying we're winning the war. It was so bad that they overran Saigon, the cha capital of Vietnam, overran the embassy. The ambassador Ellsworth Bunker is, escapes out of the embassy in his pajamas. It is so bad that Walter Cronkite, for the first time, came on television and said, whoever's been telling us we're winning the war is not telling the truth. Uh, as a result of that, it becomes payback time, and Cali is a part of the Americal Division, part of Task Force Barker. He's the lowest ranking, smallest officer on the, uh, in the unit. He's smallest five, in stature? Five foot three inches tall, Oof. 109 pounds. He is a second lieutenant. He's his unit, the people in his unit laugh at him. His commanding officer makes fun of him. And then they are told that they are to go into uh, this Quang Nai province and eradicate the 48th VC Battalion, which is a, they fought the French, they fought the Japanese, and now they're fighting the Americans to get them out of Vietnam. And uh, the task force is set up to eradicate the 48th VC Battalion in Quang Nai province and to make the area uninhabitable. They go in the night before uh, they have a company meeting. The orders are given that they are to destroy and make it uninhabitable. They are to kill everything and everyone in the village. The uh, a question is asked of the commanding company commander, Ernest Mad Dog Medina, who died last year, I think. Uh, when you say everyone, do you mean uh, women and children? And according to Butch Groover, who I interviewed personally, Groover said his answer was, when I come through the village, I don't want to see anything walking, living, breathing, crawling, moving, or growing. And that's what they did. And Cali participated in it. He participated in a big way. He ordered people to kill people. Uh, one witness said that he grabbed a child, didn't know if it was a boy or girl, uh, approximately two years old, pitched it through the air and shot at it with an automatic weapon as it went into a ditch. It was a horrible, 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 horrible event. Bodies are stacked up on top of bodies, and the thing about it is all we ever heard about was Callie, and all we ever heard about was what he did. But more than 500 people died that day with the commanding officers. Medina's on the ground. Lieutenant Colonel Barker's in a helicopter here. Colonel Warren Henderson's in a helicopter here, and Major General Samuel Costum's in a helicopter here, watching and communicating with what's on the ground. But Cali becomes the focus because of Seymour Hershey's article. He becomes the focus. And it spreads all across the country that he is a ghoul, he is a uh, mass murderer, he is a demonic human being. Well, I've been at the, <laughs> I graduated in September, I mean, I. Graduated in May of 1970, was commissioned in September of 1971 as a JAG officer 
and in September, uh, in 1970 as a JAG officer. In September of 1971, I'm appointed to defend Lieutenant William L. Calley, Jr. in his appeals. Because he'd already been convicted. He was convicted of murder, sentenced to life in prison. Mass murder. 20, not less than 22 Vietnamese of unknown ages and sexes. So, tell us about your work for him can we, on appeal. Can we take a break and come we, back? We can take a break. So, Houston, let's talk about the Cali appeal. Okay. And when it started and how long it lasted and then the impact that it's had on your life since well, uh, then. As you and I have discussed probably a thousand times, it, uh, the impact it had, it had the greatest impact on my life of any single experience in my life. The, uh, I was appointed in September of 1971 to defend him. I, saw his trial transcript and record in the back end of an Army Green pickup truck. The transcript was 5,022 pages long, not counting the pretrial hearings. The exhibits were more than 15,000 pages long. Uh, photographs, statements, and the like. Uh, I was appointed by Colonel McCartan. He called me in, and my immediate supervisor, uh, Captain Frank Ginhart, was in the office, and I wondered why they were calling me in. And it was shortly after I'd gotten the decision in the Burton case, and uh, Colonel McCartan said, uh, Houston, I've decided that I, I want to appoint you to the represent Lieutenant Callie in his appeal if you're willing to do it. And I thought, he said, I want you to take a day or so to think about it. And I thought, uh, Colonel McCartan, unless I t tell you differently in the morning, uh, this is the case of the century, why wouldn't I want to do it? Uh, that is, an indication of how naive I was, but it's also an indication of kind of the way I grew up. Uh, I grew up because we moved so much, I grew up fighting against the odds. Uh, you know, I fought, I didn't like bullies. Uh, I didn't like uh, people running over other people. Uh, Callie had become, I did not approve and do not now, I've never tried to justify what he did, but he wasn't the only one and all of us in the Army knew that he wasn't the only one. Uh, we in this country uh, live this, uh, live this facade that we are not a violent country. We live the facade that we are adhere to the laws of war which we imposed on the Nazis and the Japanese and for good cause after World War II. But Cali wasn't charged with a war crime. He was charged with premeditated murder just as if somebody here in Nashville committed premeditated murder. And you know, I've been working with, with a case recently like that. The premeditated murder, a municipal crime, simply is inapposite to apply to a wartime combat situation because to be guilty of premeditated murder, you've got to have a dead body, you've got to have uh, somebody doing the killing, and you've got to have, you've thought about it before you're going to do it. But in a combat mission from the beginning, you have premeditated you're going to go kill somebody. You are armed and there, and you're going to do it. So the only thing left is, was the killing justified in some way under the law? Well, when Callie was charged, President Nixon, Secretary of the Army Reeser, Secretary of the Defense 
Laird, Secretary, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Chief of Staff of the Army, General Westmoreland, who was in Vietnam as the commander of MACV at the time, had gone around the country saying there's no justification or excuse for what Callie did. Well, that's the only defense he ever had, but they did that before it was ever tried. Uh, here's a five foot three inch, 109 pound second lieutenant, the lowest ranking officer on the ground, and he's the only one convicted. He wasn't the only one charged, but he was the only one charged with what they could convict him of. And they charged him with premeditated murder. And I, I just thought, no, he could have been charged with a war crime and he would have had, he would have had the defense of obedience to orders. He would have had a, a defense that I'm just carrying out policy. Those things which would not only have been a defense that justified what he did, but it would have been a defense to mitigate his punishment. So from the get-go, uh, the more I read about and heard about and listened to what the administration, the Johnson administration, and then the Nixon administration were saying uh, about what happened, and it's really it's only the Nixon administration, uh, I thought, this is, this is unfair. My gut said it was unfair. So yeah, it was the number one case of the century, and yes, I'll play. So, <clears throat> did, when did you meet your client? Approximately two months after I was appointed, I requested uh, temporary duty orders to go meet with Callie. I met with him at his, in, he was confined to quarters at Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, I met with him. He's a little guy. I mean, he was a tiny guy. And he looked so young, and he, even though he's a little older than I was, but he really looked young. I was already getting bald, so I looked older. But uh, he saluted. Uh, he was uh, gracious. He was gentle. He was thankful. He appreciated, and I didn't find out until 30 years later that he felt sorry for me because I'd been appointed to represent him. He, Did you uh, have any help in this case? I was, uh, yeah, I had, uh, uh, he had his civilian lawyer, who was Judge uh, George Latimer, former Court of Military Appeals judge, former Utah Supreme Court judge. Judge Latimer, though, was our age now, uh, then, and he was tired, and uh, when I talked to him, first, the first thing I did when I was appointed, called him, and I said, I want to do what you want me to do, and he said, well, son, he was a courtly, uh, he called himself a backsliding Mormon, but he was a courtly guy and he said, uh, Captain Gordon, uh, you're looking at this with fresh eyes. I want you to take the lead. And so that was our working relationship and I told him I would, did not want to file anything, motions or anything else unless he approved. And we did that and we agreed in that conversation that he would handle the press because I didn't want all the calls. I got them anyway, but I didn't want all the calls. And I would, I would work on the brief. So I started working on the brief and I started reading the record and things jumped out at me like Wine was charged with, with a crime of murder, not a war crime. Why was all the publicity? Why did they, why was he the only one convicted? When we knew or I knew by that time that you know, that this was not just one guy or one platoon. This was every platoon in that company and in B Company doing exactly the same thing on the same day, in the same area, for the same reason, and yet he's the only one it fell back on. Uh, why, did the, why did the Pentagon come out with this? Uh, it was, and I, I write about it in the book, why did the Pentagon come out with this uh, deluge of publicity focused on Cali and funneled to the reporters. The Washington Post, uh, New York Times, the major newspapers in the country all gave the uh, American Army military line that this is an aberration, this is not what we do, it's against American policy, it's against 
all this stuff. And so I just started researching and found out that as early as 1962 or 3, Jonathan Shell had written about the village of Ben Souk, and they called him a communist and uh, were. He was 23 years old when he reported on it, and uh, the powers that be jumped all over him about writing about what the war was really like. And there were others that were castigated as well, morally safer among others. Tell us about the progress of the case of the appeal. I mean, I know you <clears throat> wrote a brief and you uh, that took a long time, but and then you filed the brief. Filed a brief. It was more than 400 pages long. It alleged more than 30 uh, errors, and it went after the command responsibility. I brought in the uh, this is when it got dicey. Uh, the more I read and the more I found out and the more we were able to substantiate, even though most of the stuff was kept secret and we couldn't get it, but that uh, Westmoreland, two days after the My Lai, or My Lai massacre took place, uh, sent a Telex commendation to Task Force Barker and in particular to C Company and B Company and their commanders for their outstanding performance uh, in the My Lai Song Mei incident. Uh, Major General Coster uh, sent the same kind of message. Colonel Orrin Henderson said and commended the two company commanders for the aggressiveness shown in carrying out the operation. It was written up in the Army Times as a great victory uh, for the Army. And then it, when uh, uh, Ridenauer sends his letter, he, uh, this, I can go really deep in the weeds, but a guy who was a former member of the military unit had some of his buddies tell him what happened, and he couldn't believe it. And so he went on his own asking questions, and he ended up writing uh, the Secretary of the Army, uh, 23 different congressmen about what happened, and they asked for an inquiry. And then that's when it came out. A source in the Pentagon contacted a friend of Seymour Hershey's who contacted him and told him there's a second lieutenant being charged for uh, massacre in Vietnam, you need to look into this. And so he gets all this information and they tell him about a witness and he goes talk to this witness and then he talks to others. And so the focus from the very beginning, orchestrated in my opinion, focused on Cali. We're going to keep it at the lowest level. And the reason I say that now is that in 2000, I want to say 2006, they finally released H.R. Haldeman's notes where the My Lai uh, group within the White House uh, planned to keep it at the lowest level, discredit one of the witnesses, and we may have to involve, quote, dirty tricks, end quote. The day after that happened, that meeting, uh, Lynn Nossinger, who was the, if you recall, those of us old enough to recall, he was the hit man for the enemy list for Nixon. He goes to see uh, 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 Mendel Rivers, who's the chair of the Armed Services Committee, who then appoints F. Edward Abair to head up a Mali investigating committee for the purpose, quite frankly, of keeping the Army's image. And so they call all these witnesses and focus on what happened at my life over. And then the Peers Commission is appointed by General Westmoreland. He appoints General Peers, who happened to be in the Corps next to uh, Quang Nai province. Uh, when this happened, he was a commanding officer there. and. He is appointed, but he is not to investigate the criminal charges. He's only to investigate the so-called cover-up of the criminal charges. General Pierce has spent years with the CIA 
And so I've got all these suspicions going on in my mind about this just doesn't make sense. One of the things that Latimer had raised at the trial was the command responsibility that came out of the war crimes trials in Nuremberg and in Tokyo, and in particular General Yamashita was tried, convicted, and 45 days later executed for command responsibility of what happened in the Philippines to American and Filipino villagers uh, by the Japanese Navy, even though for most of the time Yamashita was in the hospital in Tokyo, and then he, when he arrived, uh, the Navy ignored his orders, and uh, the similarity between what the uh, Filipino guerrillas were doing and what the Vietnamese guerrillas were doing, I mean, they, they were just alike. So I raised the issue of command influence. And by that time, Colonel McCartan had left, and Colonel Melnick was my new boss. And he came in one day and said, uh, Captain Gordon, uh, the Judge Advocate General's office, who happened to be General Prue, who was Westmoreland's staff judge advocate in Vietnam, uh, General uh, Prue's office has said they want a copy of your brief before you file it. And I'd never heard of that before. So I asked everybody in the office, have y'all ever heard that before? No. I said, well, I'll need to call Judge Latimer. <clears throat> and I learned a lot from Judge Latimer. And this is one of the things I learned. I told him, and he was quiet for a moment. He said, well, Captain, I tell you what. You just tell them that you talk to me and that I want a copy of that order in writing. And then he chuckled. He said, I don't think you're here anymore, son. <laughs> and so I reported to Colonel Meldick and said, Judge Latimer says that uh, he needs that order in writing. And that's the last we ever heard of that. So I filed it. Uh, the Pentagon is not happy. Uh, I make an argument. You filed it where? In the Court of Military Review, which is the first level free Army colonel sitting on the Court of Military Review. And that's when the rude awakening really started to happen. Uh, what, what, when, what year was that? 71, 72? 72. 72. Okay. Filed it, 400 pages, lots of issues, one of which was command responsibility. And the other one was that if you applied the laws of war, uh, he had a defense if you didn't, if, that he wouldn't have had for premeditated murder because you can't order somebody to commit premeditated murder, but you can order somebody to slaughter people under the laws of war. And I should have seen it coming, but I got a question from the guy who, Judge Alley, who uh, ended up being a federal district judge in Oklahoma and was there when the Oklahoma City bombing took place. I went by to see Wayne Alley shortly after that occurred. And he wrote the opinion, but during the oral argument, he asked, well, Captain Gordon, you're saying that Callie didn't have this mens rea and that he had been told to kill these people, but they were women and children. Are you saying that they were fair game? And I answered in his mind they were fair game. Well, two days later, the Washington Post prints an editorial called uh, Justifying Mass Murder. And it, uh, I, I can quote it, but I won't, but basically it said that I had besmirched the Army's reputation, the military justice reputation. Americans ought to be ashamed, and I in particular uh, had demeaned uh, the military justice system and that started the death threats and the Christmas cards with bodies in them and caused me a considerable bout of ang uh, uh, amount of angst, uh, including uh, Back to Jefferson. So tell us about Back to Jefferson. Yeah, I'm, I'm hope I can hold it better than I did when I started digging up the bones to write the book. <clears throat> but I thought, 
surely not. This can't be happening. They can't possibly. That's not what I argued, number one. And number two, I don't represent the Army. I represent Lieutenant Cowley. My oath was to defend him. And here they are saying that I'm representing the Army and making this argument and that I am ought to be ashamed that I'm justifying killing babies. And I remembered that Seymour Hersh and Mary McGrory were sitting together. Mary McGrory is another award-winning journalist who wrote for the Evening Star at the time. And she had misinterpreted, but not as badly as the editorial did, what the argument was. And I remember being told by friends of mine who sat directly behind them that they didn't pay any attention to the argument. They talked the whole time they were uh, there. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But I was angry. I was hurt. I picked up the paper Saturday morning, went back in, read the first section, then turned to the editorial page, and I read that, and it, I, did a, I didn't sleep any that night or the next night or a few weeks later. But that Sunday night, I went, I'd gone back to the office on Saturday and went back, and I reread my oral argument. I reread what I thought was the response I gave, and I just couldn't get it out of my mind. And during that time, because I was wired all the time, I would drive down about five miles to the Jefferson Memorial, and back then you could go at any time. You know, they didn't close it. Park rangers, I went there so much that they uh, they recognized me, and they'd say, hey, Captain, how are you doing today, that sort of thing. Well, I go to the memorial that night, and I just break down emotionally, weeping. And... Uh, I'm sitting on the top steps and I'm thinking, what in the world am I going to do? How can I respond to this? This is not fair. What kind of op-ed can I write? What can I, who can I get to help me respond to something that's totally unfair and I'm the target? And I'm sitting on the top steps and it's really weird thinking back on it, but I'm sitting there and this huge statue is behind me of Jefferson and he's looking out across the tidal basin toward the White House. And I was, I, I felt envy. I envied the statue because it didn't feel anything. And the, then I got to thinking about Jefferson and I got to thinking about what they had written about me. And as I was sitting there thinking, I remembered how he was attacked. And when I was, at, when I was in Charlottesville on my off time, I spent my off time, I spent playing cards for a while, and then I decided I wasn't very good at that. So I spent my time digging into the Jefferson archives, reading Dumas Malone's book. He had had three out by that time, ended up with like five or six. And I learned everything I could learn about Jefferson. One of the things I learned was that he, when they attacked him, they said he was a coward, that he was guilty of treason, that he was guilty of debauchery with his wife's half-sister, a slave, which ended up being true and which I learned at that time uh, as well because I went to the archives and I learned about how he responded to those attacks and he responded by acting like that never happened. They called him the Sphinx because he never responded. So I decided right then I'm not going to respond. One of the park rangers come by, comes by and uh, he said, Captain, you okay? And I said, I've had better days. <laughs> Got up, and at that time I knew everything that was carved in those walls. I could quote them all. Can't now, but I can quote the one around the top. And it said, I have sworn upon the altar of God eternal hostility toward every form of tyranny over the mind of man. And I got to thinking about 
that and Wayne Greenhall, a young journalist. Seymour Hearst gets credit for breaking the story, but Greenhall broke it in a little Alabama newspaper. He wrote a book, and in that book he said, a question I have for middle America, the parents of these young men, what is it about our society, political, social, or military, that allows young men to do what they did that day? And as I was reading around the top, I thought of that question and about what kind of tyranny over the mind of Callie and those people of that day caused them to jettison their consciences, to forget about morality, and to just slaughter people. And I've been thinking about that for the last 50 years. I defended Cali at the Court of Military Review. I knew we were going to lose. We lost three zip. Took it to the Court of Military Appeals. Thought we had a shot there. We lost two to one there with Chief Judge Darden dissenting, saying that he was tried under the wrong standard, which I had argued, which the Post had said that I was justifying mass murder by arguing that standard. He said that that should be the standard. But then, I'm, by that time, it's 1974, and I'm about, or late 73, and I'm about to get out of the Army. Uh, he's about, Callie's about to be shipped from Fort Benning in his quarters to Leavenworth. We're scurrying around. Melnick comes in, Colonel Melnick, I'm sorry. Colonel Melnick comes in and tells me, you know that you cannot appear in the federal district courts, the civilian courts. The Judge Advocate General will not allow you to do that. You know that, don't you? And I said, well, I do now. And, <clears throat> sir, and he uh, left, and so I immediately called Latimer. Latimer got, gets a hold of a lawyer in Columbus, Georgia, by the name of Kenneth Henson, on my weekend so that I am not working on <laughs> something on my duty hours. I'm writing the petition for habeas corpus. I'm getting out of the Army in April, but Cali's going to be transferred to Leavenworth, and he's going to be in a different federal jurisdiction if we do that. We want to file the habeas corpus in Georgia. I send the habeas corpus petition to Latimer. He sends it to Henson, who files it and gets an immediate stay of, of his transfer to Leavenworth. They have a hearing on the stay, and Latimer and Henson come up with this idea that I can't appear as a lawyer, but I can appear as an expert witness, so they subpoena me as an expert witness. The Army figures out what's going on, and they subpoena my friend, Bob Roth, who handled the government side as an expert witness, we go down and we're sworn in in front of Judge J. Robert Elliott, and for the next four and a half hours, he quizzes us about what the case is about, and uh, he enters the stay order that they can't do it, and then there's machinations going to the Army goes ex parte to the Chief Judge of the Sixth Circuit, Fifth Circuit. Uh, I don't learn about that until much later, but at any rate, uh, the, it ends up that Judge Elliott reverses his conviction, orders him freed, the Army appeals it. The Army's lawyer, who had been the clerk for Chief Judge Brown, on the Fifth Circuit, gets on the phone, gets a stay order issued ex parte. Uh, that irritates me a little bit. By this time, I'm out of the Army, so I file a motion in the Supreme Court of the United States asking the supervisory justice to take note of the fact that this ex parte proceeding has taken place, and that's unfair, and we'd like to be heard. That motion, to my knowledge, is still pending, but Justice, I learned it was Justice Powell lately, but I thought it was Justice Brennan who was supervisory judge, but apparently it was Justice Lewis Powell who contacted the judges in the Fifth Circuit and told them to get, get on the stick down there, and all of a sudden all of the judges of the Fifth Circuit are meeting in New Orleans. They have lifted the stay. Cali, uh, can remain out of jail while the appeal is going on and the judges decide to 
hear the case en banc. So all of the judges of the Fifth Circuit are going to hear the case. Uh, we uh, challenge uh, Judge, Chief Judge Brown, who recuses himself. We challenge two former military officers on the court, and we are left with 13 judges. We argue the case there. When? Uh, I believe this would have been in 74, 73. Sometime in 73, I can look it up, but we lose it 8 to 5 with Griffin Bale writing a scathing dissent. But by this time, we've been working the idea of getting commutation, uh, which you are very familiar with. Now, uh, we, uh, I've gone and seen the Secretary of the Army and asked him to commute Cali's sentence. He commutes it from 20 to 10 years, and then he uh, orders him released on parole during the pending of the Fifth Circuit decision, so he's out of jail. So Callie spent a total of uh, about three and a half weeks in Leavenworth and the rest of it in confinement to his quarters, and he is free, but his conviction is upheld. The Supreme Court denied certiorari in uh, April of 70. Five seventy six. I'll have to look that up too. But that's the Cali story. So, when he came to Covington, Tennessee, uh, I got to know him very well. He's in hospice right now. Uh, talked to him a couple of months ago, and I've still got it on my phone messages that uh, he had returned my call, and he l left the message, "I love you." So tell us what you have in front of you there. This is a book I hope that somebody publishes called Blind Obedience, Debunking the Myths of the My Lai Massacre and the American, America's War in Vietnam. It talks, it tries to answer the question that Wayne Greenhall asked. What, it is, what is it about American society? What is it about our military, social, legal society that allows America, good, average, American, middle-class boys to do what they did that day? And that's, that's the purpose of the book. And it's also it's history about how we got there, why we shouldn't have been there got wrong. Got where? In Vietnam. Fighting a war in Vietnam upholding a dictatorship that we put into power based upon the lies of Eisenhower who says it's a democratically elected government, Kennedy who says it's a democratically elected government, Johnson who says it's a democratically elected government, and Nixon who says it's a democratically elected government, and it was a dictatorship that took the South Vietnamese people off of their lands and put them in refugee camps with barbed wire around them, displaced them, and handed out the lands to the cronies of the DM regime and the subsequent regimes. Wrong war, wrong place for the wrong reason. And many American deaths. 58,386, I think, and 370,000 wounded American soldiers, physically wounded, and many more than that that are mentally and psychologically wounded until 1993 in my office on the square in Covington, Tennessee, I would have people that I never met before show up just to talk. And you've written that book over the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, parts of it. I think it's a good time to stop. Unless you want, is there anything else you want to add about Cali and the book? I think, I, I think the experience of representing someone like that against all the odds and fighting the powers that be, it just changed my life. You know, they, this idea that we succumb to fear 
or we succumb to pressure or we succumb to political pressure or family pressure, you know, somewhere along the line, it became important to me that I may not be right, but I'm going to try to do what's right. Houston, as we conclude the conversation about uh, the Cali case in that period of time in your life, were there people involved in your life during that period of time that were important to you before while you were in Washington? Absolutely. Of course, uh, my cousin A.B. was there with Baker at that time, Senator Baker, and he was important. Uh, I talked to him a lot during that time. Uh, also, uh, my last supervisor in the office, Dennis Hines, Captain Dennis Hines, uh, supported me. He gave me total independence. He protected me from the pressures of command a lot. And uh, I credit him with uh, my, when I left the Army, I was surprised to receive the Meritorious Service Medal, which is the highest medal that one of my rank could receive. And I'm convinced that Dennis wrote the commendation because it took the, looks like it took the Washington Post editorial and rebutted every sentence in it. Uh, it was, uh, he was very important. Uh, Captain Alan Dubois and his wife uh, gave me a place to stay right before I moved back to uh, Tennessee and really important uh, uh, Captain Richard Evans worked as my quote assistant and he proofread uh, and double checked case citations and uh, talked about the argument with me and then the faith community there that I was part of Philip Morrison who is now here in Nashville was there and a couple by the name of uh, Kenneth and Barbara Link. Uh, they were my outlet. Uh, Kenny was an all-American track star at uh, Abilene Christian College, and he and I would run. And I did a lot of running in those days. I don't do any now, obviously, but a lot then. They were very, very important. So <coughs> when, when did you leave? Washington? I packed up all of my earthly belongings in a uh, five by eight U-Haul and uh, my then wife had already moved back to Tennessee some months before and I drove back to Covington, Tennessee and I was then trying to decide where I wanted to practice law. As you know, while I was in Washington, I got a master's in tax law. Uh, Why did you do that? Well, because you suggested it, number one, and number two, it was there, and the government would pay for it, and I was able to do it, and I learned it was good experience. I never practiced in tax law except defending people who were charged with tax crimes, but uh, I got to study negotiations from the guy who negotiated the Panama Canal Treaty, and I learned a lot in that class. We negotiated everything. So I learned a lot in that class. But then I moved back to Covington, and I'd talked with uh, law firms in Washington. I'd talked to some law firms in uh, Atlanta, and I talked to, was scheduled to talk to a law firm in Chicago. And uh, I uh, had a friend in New York that I was going to talk with as well, who was in the Army at the same time I was, and introduced me to the United States Supreme Court. Barry Kingham, but I was at home and I went to the post office in Covington to pick up a package for my mother. And I'm coming out of the post office and a local banker by the name of Charles Smith, he was president of Tipton County Farmers Union Bank, caught me uh, just as I was walking down the steps with a package and he said, Houston, what are you doing? And I said, well, Mr. Charles, just got out of the Army and I'm trying to decide where I want to practice law and he asked me about that. And, uh, in about a 10 minute conversation, <clears throat> he got toward the end and he said, 
well, while you're trying to decide where you practice, we need a lawyer around here. Why don't you just hang out a shingle while you're trying to decide? And I said, well, Mr. Charles, I don't have any money. I just got out of the Army. I'm broke. And he said, oh, I'll loan you the money. And so he loaned me $10,000 on a signature note, and I'm still trying to decide where I want to practice law. There you are. That's great. In Covington, Tennessee. From the square in Covington, Tennessee since 1974. So let's talk about that career from 1974 forward and um, tell us the types of cases that you handled and what you've uh, done. And um, let me let you just talk about it for a few minutes and then let's talk about some specific cases because this could take, you know, two or three days if we don't uh, specify some important cases to you. Well, you need to, to cut me off because it's been quite a ride. I mean, what a ride. Uh, I have, uh, obviously, I've represented somebody convicted of mass murder. <clears throat> Excuse me. I prosecuted a serial killer. And how did you do that? I was an assistant DA for two years in Tipton County and Lauderdale County and McNary County and uh, uh, Hardeman County and Fayette County. And I, this guy, had, uh, he and his partner had gone across the United States hitchhiking and people would pick them up and they'd kill them and take their uh, wallet, money, and car and then dump it after a while. And they killed a student from University of Chattanooga in Fayette County and Preston Parks and I, another DA, prosecuted him. He's still doing his life sentences. Okay. So... Uh, I represented a bull by the name of Soul Man in federal court in Texas. Uh, I've done a bank fraud case in California, represented one of the 9-11 families after 9-11. Uh, I have uh, represented the people that mean the most are those I call the left out and left behind. I've represented a, a couple from North Mississippi, whose son died because of a bridge falling in, an African-American couple. This was early on in my career. The bridge fell in and uh, the, sued the county, Marshall County, and the road commissioners and the leaders of Marshall County for the kid's death because he was on a tractor and the bridge fell in. And the reason given by the county commissioner when they asked the African-American community asked for the bridge to be fixed. He was quoted as saying, well, I'm not going to fix that bridge. It's nothing but a blank road anyway. Unbeknownst to him, the little boy's grandmother was recording it. And so I took it to federal court my first year of law practice on my own. So I guess you were doing a lot of advertising and on TV. And I, how, how did these people find you? I don't know. I, yeah, I do know how they found me. I'd represented the biggest thug in Fayette County by the name of Ronnie Tipler in federal court when the police in Moscow, Tennessee, Moscow, Tennessee, had beaten him up with a slapstick after he'd been handcuffed over the chief uh, police's car. And uh, uh, Ronnie Tipler worked with Wayne Perkins, and that's how they found me. How do all these other people find you? I don't know. I don't know. I don't advertise. Never advertised a day in my life. I don't. I don't have any billboards. I don't do. As my, all of my friends say, you don't do email. Uh, I don't. I don't do those things. It's been by word of mouth. Don't do any social media. No. Facebook. No. Instagram. No. Twitter. No. All word of mouth. It's all. Uh, and most of that's clutter, and I, I've got too much clutter in my life now. I mean, so you, over the years, have had a number of different uh, lawyers work with you there at the Covington office and yes. um, other places. But yes. um, w tell us about uh, about that. I mean, most of the time you've been right there in Covington. And right. I uh, am pleased with the people who have 
put up with me long enough to work with me for a while. My, one of my best friends on earth is T.D. Forrester. He's one of two people in Tipton County that ever been uh, accepted as members of the American College of Trial Lawyers. Uh, and uh, Mike Whitaker was a prosecutor and then a judge, and he came to work with us uh, for several years. Uh, Weber McCraw, who's a circuit judge now, uh, worked with me. Uh, Billy Cole, who's a chancellor now, worked with me. Janet Phelps, who is a, a senior clerk at the district court here in Nashville, worked with me and she also worked with you. Uh, but there are some really, really fine lawyers who have worked with me. The last, the last uh, three, uh, since I've kind of shrunk my practice. Uh, Amber Shaw worked with me for nine years and she's now uh, a partner or a member of the Harris Shelton firm. Uh, Carly Mills was a young associate there. Uh, my niece Caroline Gordon's with Murray Williams in Memphis. Uh, your son, Charles Robert worked with me. The uh, mayor, Mayor Briley worked with me for a while. Uh, and his brother, Rob. Good people, good lawyers. Uh, I've been very fortunate. Judge, <clears throat> Judge Reed. Judge, oh yeah. And, and he still is. Uh, <laughs> uh, Judge, former Justice Lyle Reed uh, has worked with me for the last, I guess, since 2001, something like that. And there are others. I mean, there have been a bunch of them that have come through and gone on to bigger and better things. And some of them have worked, uh, most of them have worked with you at the Covington office, but you've yes. had an office in Memphis occasionally and then yes. you had a part-time Tool, office here. Blanchard Tool and I practiced law together and his father, uh, I practiced law with them. Joe Riley, I m meant to mention, Joe Riley helped me write the Fifth Circuit uh, appeal in the Cali case. Right after I got out of the Army, Joe and I practiced law together, and then he and I practiced with Blanchard Tool Sr. and Blanchard Tool the Younger and Charles Burson and Grady Garrison uh, at one time. Now, though, it's you. And, and my longtime assistant, Kathy McMahon, she came to work with me when she was 19, and uh, she's in 1975. I shouldn't have said that, that told her age. but. Uh, she's with me, and Janice Lee, whom you know very well, uh, an investigator. I still have an investigator. Uh, she's been with me about 18 years. Now. How many cases <coughs> do you have left now? Six files. Six files. I had five, and I picked one up last week because they are in my Sunday school class. But it's not a complicated one. So let's talk about, can we just... Can we pick out a handful of cases that are the are most, I know all your cases are very meaningful to you, but that would be most meaningful for the history project? Well, I think let's break them up. Let's break them up into kinds. Civil rights cases have been very important to me. Uh, people who are abused because of not not anything except race or religion or whatever. The Perkins case that I mentioned earlier, uh, the, uh, there's, after the Civil War, uh, the Yarbrough case is very important to me because one of my dearest, dearest friends is Miss Hattie Yarbrough, who, by the way, the African American Smithsonian Museum has a section uh, that Hattie Yarbrough uh, put together for them, but Hattie was a teacher and she taught uh, everyone growing up, she's 98 now, uh, she taught all of her students about African American history and she has taught me about local African American history through the years. The Yarbrough family after the Civil War, uh, the Wyatt Yarbrough bought some land and about 15 years ago two local uh, powerful white folks, uh, they, never, they never 
divided that land up so that it had like 80 people who still owned that farm. And they found a uh, guy who was on dope and an 85-year-old person with dementia and they bought their share and then tried to sell it at partitions so they could buy it in because I-69 was supposed to go through there. Well, I figured out a way to get all of the 80 people that were left to sign a deed to the Yarbrough Family Trust and it ended up being two owners rather than 80-something owners and we were able to keep their land for them. That's very important to me. Uh, I've represented a lot of teachers, uh, civil rights issues, and very important. The, I've represented uh, in criminal work, most of it's been white collar work except I did a court martial in Panama. I represented a steward who was scheduled to be on Air Force One and she was wrongly convicted because they switched her urine sample uh, in the Air Force. I did a, uh, like I said, I did a court martial in Panama. I represented uh, a young African American along with Mike Whitaker, man who was shot in the stomach by the chief deputy of Marshall County, Mississippi with a sawed off shotgun in federal court. Uh, let's see, in, uh, but I, I think my most rewarding experience is representing little children, catastrophically injured little children. Uh, I, uh, I'll get emotional about these, but Alice Simpson, the first time I met Alice, she was in a hospital room with one leg up like this, the other leg stretched out like that, her arms in casts and her neck in a brace, one eye looked that way and one eye looked that way. And I was able to help her and the neatest thing was getting a letter from her uh, that began, Dear Mr. Gordon, I don't remember what you look like. And she was telling me she was graduating from high school. Harmony Marshall and her mother Melody Marshall who she was catastrophically injured. She had seven symptoms of spinal meningitis that went untreated for six days. And she was a spastic quadriplegic, blind, mute, deaf child. And we were able to take care of her all of her life. Marty Armstrong the first products liability case that Chief Justice, or that Justice Janice Holder tried as trial court judge. Mike Whitaker and I tried that one. Uh, Jonathan Reynolds, who uh, was injured at a laser tag arena and ended up having uh, flesh-eating fasciitis that ate up his leg and destroyed part of his brain. We were able to help him. Uh, Billy Mills against Ford Motor Company. That's a case where the Supreme Court of Tennessee said that it's juries who decide the amount of damages, not judges. And uh, he was a paraplegic, and I hear from Billy a lot. He and his mama. There, there are probably two dozen others of uh, catastrophically injured children represented elderly people who their kids are beating them up and I've represented children who's been abused. I've, uh, Most all of those, uh, in, or all of those I guess is contingent fee cases where you were uh, represented, you represented them as plaintiffs. Yes, or pro bono. Right. And so, um, Today, uh, with the caps on damages, is that does that make this process harder, more difficult? It makes it harder and it makes it more difficult and it's just a symptom of our society where we have sold everything to the powerful. We've sold it to corporations. They control the legislators with uh, the Supreme Court, United States Supreme Court's decision in uh, Citizens United, 
Uh, we have somehow said that corporations have a right to speech. Uh, I assume they have a right to bear arms too, since they are, uh, so we can have private armies. I, it's just incredible to me that a country that was founded on the idea that of individual liberty, we have bought and sold it, and now the legislature has placed caps on it. I have, personally think that if the Supreme Court of Tennessee ever hears the issue of caps in personal injury cases, they'll find it unconstitutional because uh, the right to trial by jury at common law was the right to have the jury decide the amount of damages, not, not judges and not legislators. What about the, uh, the case here in Nashville where uh, they changed the law so you could collect a judgment uh, against uh, NES? Yeah, NES, that's really interesting. You know about that because uh, it's a NASCAR cafe explosion. Uh, really interesting. Don and Irma Wilson from Spokane, Washington were here on their uh, retirement. And uh, Mayor Bredesen was the mayor. Uh, the uh, Speaker of the House at that time was Jimmy Nafee, who's my close friend and client and representative and neighbor. Uh, John Wilder was Lieutenant Governor, and NES was the municipality here, and the Wilsons are walking down Broad That's Street. That's Nashville Electric, sir. Nashville Electric. Uh, walking down Broadway, and it, all of a sudden the uh, sidewalk exploded, and they're covered with burning oil and uh, water, oxygen to feed the fire, and I turned it down, as you well know, I turned it down uh, three times, and then on the fourth time, the guy that married Debbie and me called me, and out of the blue, he didn't tell me who it was, said, hey, it's Houston, I've got this couple, I'd like you to help if you don't mind, and uh, he said, uh, I said, okay, Ken, I'll do that, who? And he told me, Don Norma Wilson, and I went, Okay, I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> and a very prominent lawyer called me on the other side and told me that I ought to not take it. It's just going to cost me money and they wouldn't be able to collect anything but the caps anyway, which were $300,000. And over a period of, I guess, about a year and a half, we were able to avoid the caps and the settlement was made with, I think there were nine or ten lawyers in the room representing the various defendants. The Wilsons were taken care of. Uh, this community reached out, particularly the Woodmont Church, reached out to them and took care of them. And uh, Irma, when I first saw her, she looked like a mummy, wrapped up in Vanderbilt Hospital. She couldn't speak. Don was wrapped up too, but not quite as bad. But uh, uh, thank the good Lord and the people here and the people who were in political positions to make a difference made a difference and took care of them. And if you saw Irma today, you'd never know she was burned and she had already gotten the final rights when I met her. And I assume that uh, settlement <laughs> was confidential in terms of the amount of money. The total the amount, yes. Yeah. Well, it wasn't with what the government paid, but the rest of it was. Right, right. So, I mean, obviously we can talk about cases on and on. Uh, criminal defense, you want to give us a couple of examples that are important to you? Um, well, uh, I represented a young man, in fact, I saw him two weeks ago, who uh, was charged with attempted first-degree murder but he was off of his medication and it was a case that I tried and he was, uh, we, it was the first case in Tipton County history where we tried the insanity defense and it came back 11 to one that he was not guilty by reason of insanity and the judge found that he went ahead and directed a verdict that he was not guilty by reason of insanity. He went to Western State a hospital and they got him back on his medicine and I saw him uh, two weeks ago and he was uh, doing great and effusive in his comments to my wife which made me feel good but he uh, 
he's doing well. That was State, uh, State versus Bobby Butler was another murder case in which the Supreme Court adopted the uh, holding of the United States Supreme Court in Alaska, uh, State, Alaska versus somebody, uh, which says that a juvenile record that has to do with uh, dishonesty uh, has to be produced to the defense if that person is going to testify. Uh, I've, you know, Charles, I've done so many criminal cases. Uh, I just, some of, yeah. are, some of them are hilarious. Yeah. And some of so them you are. have one left, one criminal case left? Well, two, counting the one that we're about to do, finish up right away, but uh, I have one double homicide case to try. I began my career doing uh, homicide defense. Looks like I'm going to end it. Doing the homicide defense. Right. So, uh, do you prefer criminal case or civil cases? <laughs> I'm a trial lawyer. Uh, that's what I do. I don't. Uh, I don't do contracts. I don't go to general sessions as. Uh, Ms. Bernstein and I were talking earlier, I don't do divorces, I try lawsuits, and uh, my mentors, whether they knew they were mentors or not, were the people like Lucius Birch and, and uh, uh, Bobby Lee Cook and Jerry Spence and people who just tried lawsuits. And somewhere along the line, I realized that uh, I could do that and I've been blessed to be able to do it now for uh, a long, long time. So let's leave the trial practice unless you have one specific that I haven't asked about that you want to talk about. And we can always come back to that. But I'd like to talk about some of the other things you've done. And, um, you know, the list of honors is way too long for us to get into. but. Um, but I'm not interested in I love me stuff. Either. Yeah. So, but about <clears throat> what about teaching and writing? I know writing is such a. You've already mentioned the book that you uh, that you have here with you about Vietnam. But what? what uh, tell us just some of the writing that you've done. Some scholarly, some fiction. Well. Uh, I've written a lot of legal briefs, a lot of legal memoranda, and uh, memoranda, and uh, I like history. Uh, so the book that we talked about is history and a memoir. But the uh, I wrote a novel, and I hope to write another one uh, that my Debbie talked me into one night at dinner uh, when we were on vacation. We were sitting having dinner. And she said, Houston, you've done all this stuff. And she started listing some of the stuff that you may ask me about later that I'd done. Uh, what have you always wanted to do you haven't done? And I said, well, I've always wanted to write. And she said, well, you write all the time. You stay up at, get up in the middle of the night writing. I said, well, that, that's legal stuff. I'm talking about other stuff. She said, what do you mean? I said, fiction. I'd like to write fiction. She said, well, why don't you? And this is August. We're in Quebec City, Canada. And she said, why don't you? And I said, well, maybe I can at Christmas during the holidays I can start. And she said, no, why don't you? And I said, well, you know, the November holidays, our boys go to their other parents during Thanksgiving. Maybe I can then. She said, no, Houston, why don't you? <laughs> and I said, you mean like right now? And she said, yeah, tell me a story. So the first chapter in the novel, The Plains of Abraham, is what I told her after writing notes on a cocktail napkin. So I told her the first the story, the first chapter in The Plains of Abraham, and I ended up writing the novel. So. And that was published in what? 2006. 2006. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I, want, I keep running into people saying, when are you going to do a sequel? So I hope to do a sequel before too long. And then you've done a lot of teaching. I've taught at the College of Trial Advocacy at University of Tennessee. I've done seminars 
all over the place. Taught at Dyersburg State for a while. Uh, I, you know, why? Why? Why do, why do you do that? Because they need somebody. <laughs> Aren't you teaching your competitors? That's okay. I do that all the time. That's the greatest joy of the people that I mentioned earlier practicing law is to watch them become really good at their craft. To watch them be able to do it better than I. That they, they become really good at their craft. Okay, so we got uh, still a lot to cover. Let's talk about two journeys we've been on. So talk about um, your um, interest in being on the Supreme Court of Tennessee. <laughs> uh, you, you're getting into my rejection list now. But. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that's important. I, I truly believe that our system of justice, as it was designed to be, not as we've twisted it and contorted it over the last half century, but as it was designed to be, was to provide the ability for individuals to take their disputes and go in front of a judge and an impartial jury and have their dispute ended. And that as a civilized society, if people believed that they were going to be treated fairly, it didn't matter if you were black or white or Hispanic, didn't matter if you were straight or gay, it didn't matter if it worked the way it was supposed to work. Twelve good and honest people would make the decision, an impartial judge would decide if that decision was was within the range of reasonableness. Is this, did, are there facts to back up what they've found? And that justice would be not just, it may never be done completely, but at least people feel like they have been treated equitably and fairly. As I started looking at the time at what was happening with our court system, uh, I thought, you know, I could, I think I could do that. I think I can write. I think I can, and I know, I, I feel like that I understood the issues that the court was facing and would be facing and that there was some, uh, I don't want to say bickering, but there was some, dis some slight dissension on the court that I was aware of. And so I decided to, to uh, apply and I was nominated twice. And not selected either time. Not selected. The first time I understood why I was not selected, uh, the selection was an excellent selection. But the next time I did not understand because there was no selection. And I could not believe that either I or uh, Buck Lewis were not qualified, neither one of us were qualified to sit on the Supreme Court. And so, as you well know, the, uh, there was litigation about that, and I didn't come out of that looking so good, but I don't care. I still think it was a uh, not, Buck Lewis could have done a, he would have done a good job on the court. And you think you could have transitioned from being an advocate to being a judge? I think we do that all the time. Okay. You know. Most of the cases that I have are settled. And they're not settled because we stalk around acting macho or we're yelling at somebody or we're treating the other side with disrespect. They're settled because people on both sides realize the risk of litigation and they talk about it. We don't have to be disrespectful to, to settle differences. So you uh, have done a lot of mediations I have been in this I age have, of mediation. You like it or not? I like it if people are prepared before they go to mediation. I don't like this idea. Let's go mediate it first thing. If they're not prepared, then the client suffers, the system suffers, and people get shortchanged in this process called justice. You know, I, I one of the things I like to tell young lawyers. If you want to be good at your craft, it's the three P's. Preparation, preparation, and preparation. 
if you're not prepared, you're not ready for mediation. If you don't know what the facts are, you're not ready for mediation. And I, I've had a lot of young lawyers come in, well, let's mediate this. Mediate what? You don't even know what the injuries are yet. You don't even know what the issues are yet. You know, it's not about the lawyer getting the fee. It's not my case. It's the client's case. It's their life and their interests that are at stake, not mine. You know. And what is, <laughs> how do you evaluate the quality of the profession today? A lot of really smart, a lot of really intelligent, a lot of really bright people. There is too little of too little of understanding what the system is supposed to do and there's too much trying to use the rules to to avoid justice or evade worse evade justice the rules are meant rule one I, I guarantee you ask 99 out of 100 lawyers, they can't tell you what rule one is, the rules of civil procedure or criminal procedure. And the both of them is these rules be interpreted to provide for justice least expensively possible. But too many people are trying to figure out how many hours we can get in and how I can create havoc with the other side. So let's leave the law and move to politics. Not very good at that either. <laughs> but that's been a big piece of your life over the last 50 years. So tell us your life in politics. My, uh, I've always been in history, uh, uh, interested in history and political science and politics. So I read all the time. I, you know, uh, every book that John Meacham's put out, I've read it. You know, I've read, I read all of the uh, stuff on history that comes out. The idea, the idea of, of participating in history, you know, let's face it, uh, I got a chance early on in my career to participate in history. Uh, I've been connected with people who are interested in politics, as you well know. Uh, my, I lived in West Tennessee when Ned McWhorter was the governor, Jimmy Nafe was Speaker of the House, and John Wilder was Speaker of the uh, Senate, Lieutenant Governor. John lived 10 miles from my house, Jimmy Nafe lived a mile and a half, and Ned was 90 minutes away. And what political party? That was the Democratic Party, and I'll tell you, my Mother's family are staunch Republicans from East Tennessee, ergo A.B. Culver House. Uh, and uh, my aunt only voted for one Democrat in her life, and she had to pray about that. Uh, and I was that Democrat. But uh, I, I watched Oni Nafee, Jimmy Nafee's father. He came over as a, an immigrant from Lebanon couldn't speak any English, was put out on Ellis Island, caught a train supposed to go to Covington, Tennessee, where his uncle was, and ended up in Covington, Kentucky. <laughs> Took him three weeks to get to Covington. I watched him take care of people. There are people who still go to the, his grandson's grocery store in Covington now because their grandparents were given credit during the Depression. He said, and I'll never forget it, uh, he said one time, the only thing I know about politics is everybody ought to have a job and everybody ought to have enough to eat. Growing up the way I grew up, that meant a lot to me. And so it just happened that Democrats were there. And I was, as you know, I like John Kennedy. I really like Robert Kennedy, even though I learned a lot about him later on. It made him less likable. But I was for civil rights before it was really popular to be in our part of the country. Uh, 
So you decided to do something about it in 1996? I did. You remember 1994 was another, for me, another debacle when their contract with America, that we called it contract on America, and the divisive nature of the Gingrich Revolution. And uh, I felt like that our senator at that time was no Howard Baker. And so I decided to run against him. I got mad. I got angry. I was stupid, and I ran against him. But you did the honorable thing. You, you ran and went, and that was against Fred Thompson. That was against our acting senator, Fred Thompson. Right. <coughs> right. So, but uh, I never, in that campaign, I never said one bad thing about Fred personally. And he never said anything bad about me, personally. So then you went on to become chair of the Democratic Party yep, in Tennessee. Yep, as, as your son well knows, that I thought we would raise money. This is how naive I was. I thought we'd raise money and not spend any of it in the primary. And then we'd spend it all in the general election, uh, getting the independent vote because the Tennessee Democratic Party would be able to help with the Democratic vote. Well, I went to the headquarters of the Democratic Party and the computers didn't work and the phones didn't talk to each other and there were two employees there and they had no money. And I, when I, I turned to your son at that time and I said, Charles Robert, we're going to get the H beat out of us but we're going to have some fun. So we had fun, and then when it was over, I thought that ought not happen again. So he, um, my son, Charles Robert, worked for you in that campaign in 96. Uh, you had another uh, young man uh, work for you in 96. Let's take one minute on your driver whom you had to replace. Okay. That... <laughs> uh, he is now State Senator Jeff Yarbrough from here in Nashville. His family uh, were friends of mine from college days. And uh, he was at, in Harvard at the time, and he wanted to work in the campaign. And the only job I had at the time was I needed a driver. I didn't realize that Jeff wasn't the best driver in the world. But uh, we. He, he worked in the campaign, and then after I found out that he wasn't a very good driver, we made him the advance man. <laughs> uh, the interesting thing about that, and Jeff won't mind me saying this, he is a brilliant, good guy and loves his state and loves the people. But uh, his mother and father had a fundraiser for me in Dyersburg, and his mother came up to me and she said, Houston, I just want you to know we've been praying up for you. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, I appreciate that. She said, no, no, no. Ever since we found out that Jeff was going to be your driver, we would pray for you. <laughs> we'll send him a copy of this. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's uh, move then from politics, law, to faith. And uh, talk to us about your uh, faith and kind of what what you're doing in that arena today and well i'm i'm doing the same thing that I, I did and i was doing more in epley when you and i first met and that is trying to decide trying to figure out the best way i can uh, what the purpose of this life is and who's important in this life and where did it come from so I have a, a strong desire to know. I think it was, uh, I may be wrong, but I think it was G.K. Chesterton who said it best. And he said, if I'm not quoting somebody else, he said, what people want most is not to know about God, but to be able to experience the presence of God in their lives. So. I have spent uh, a lot of time uh, searching, still searching, still searching for the truth. I think I've found 
at least where to look for it and who's in charge. So we're coming to the end here. And uh, what, what else, what's on your agenda now? Well, I want to continue to give back. You know, I had the honor of serving on the Board of Trustees of the University of Tennessee system for a, a, a full term and as vice chair of that and realized what an important what an important organization and institution that is for all the people of the state of Tennessee. And so I want to give back to UT Martin, to the College of Law in some way. I want to write. I want to continue my spiritual search. Uh, I have a Sunday school class and we're studying the mystery of the gospel. Uh, have been now for two years, and it's looking into the hidden things in Scripture, the things that are not obvious, and uh, I'm enjoying that. I enjoy my grandkids. I enjoy my children, and in particular, I enjoy my wife. She is the best thing that's ever happened to me. And you uh, can see the end zone in terms of retirement? I expect by this time next year, I will be doing what I want to do on my schedule, not some judge's schedule. And you think you can be comfortable with that? I'll never stop doing stuff, but yeah, I think I can be comfortable not being on somebody else's schedule. And why retire now? Well, I still have my wits about me, sort of. <laughs> uh, and I learned in the last trial that we're retrying, the murder case we talked about earlier. Uh, during that trial, it took three and a half weeks, and my help during the trial got sick, and I was pretty much doing it by myself, and I learned that I wasn't quite as quick on my feet as I used to be, uh, and I don't want to, I don't want to be there, uh, I don't want to be that guy that, that they get that old man out of the courtroom. <laughs> Uh, I'd rather them say, get that old man out of the courtroom. <laughs> so, uh, anything you're reading now that you would recommend to this audience? Yes, I've got several things. Uh, David Brooks, The Second Mountain, I think I told you about that one. Uh, I uh, am reading uh, uh, Songs of America which is Meacham and uh, Tim, McGraw. Tim McGraw's book. Uh, I finished Soul of America by Meacham. Uh, I'm reading a, uh, going back and reading Francis Schaeffer again, uh, The uh, Reason for God by Tim Keller. I think I've got uh, over in, uh, over at 505, here this week, I think I've got seven books I'm reading right now. Great. You listen to tapes at all? No. <laughs> Just read the hardbacks, right? Nope. I think there's something. It's like like writing notes. I don't like type notes. I don't want to type my notes. I want to write them out because I think there's something about the tactile connection between the words that you're putting on the paper. It makes it different when somebody receives it. And it's the same thing with a book. I think the feeling of the book and being able to turn the page down and then read over here and then go back to where that page turned down and feel. I think uh, feeling has a lot to do with our understanding. So we're at the end. Is, is there anything that I have not asked that you have on your list or on your mind? There's a lot on you that. Just, you just uh, reminded me of like the University of Tennessee. I left that out completely. So, Well, you asked me what I wanted to do in the future, and one of the things I want to give back, and that's one of the areas I want to give back, the Boys and Girls Club that my brother started in Covington, I want to give back there. I want to give back to the community. We're, Deb and I are doing a kind of a, a neighborhood revitalization thing at home, and we're interested in that. But. Mainly, I just want to keep living and enjoy life. I mean, God's been good to me. Travel? 
travel. We're going to Australia to see the ambassador in October, latter part of October. Uh, Great. Thank you. And um, do you sleep? Yes, yeah, some. I uh, probably uh, I've. Deb, I know the answer to that. Barry wanted me to ask you. Deb, that. Deb says that I have a biological clock that says Sunday afternoon I have to take a nap, but uh, I, I, my mind goes pretty fast most of the time, and I like, I, I'd like to say that I hope I haven't embarrassed my mama. I hope mama, or I'd anybody else in public today. I'd say your mama's awful proud. Thank uh, you. It's been a great day. Thanks.